Jesus both say, look, there are false teachers out there, and they're dangerous, and we as the church of, of Jesus Christ need to be on guard against them. But here's the thing. False teachers usually don't come strolling in wearing a big sign that says ravenous wolf, right? They usually don't have a, a, a t-shirt made up that says, I am a false teacher. They do it in secret, right? Peter says they're sly about it. Let me say this. I think there are two kinds of false teachers. There are false teachers who know they're false teachers, and there are false teachers who don't know they're false teachers. They're so sly, they've even fooled themselves. There are some false teachers who know full well what they're doing. They're purposely using the gospel for gain. They're lying, they're scamming, they're manipulating people to get what they want. And I think there are also false teachers who honestly believe the things that they're teaching. They've been taught wrong, and they're sincerely, with integrity, perpetuating those false teachings. And I think we, um, we see this on Christian TV a lot, both of these things. And it's no, no secret that I think that most Christian TV is, just to be clear, revolting and an absolute abomination and a black spot on the church. Just so you know where I'm coming from. Just so there's no... Just so I'm clear, right? I, I, I mean, it, most of it is absolutely disgusting. I think it is the antithesis of the gospel message. There are some of these guys on TV that are getting wildly rich selling piles of junk on TV, right? All this crap that they're selling. Prayer scarves for just three easy payments of $39.99. And if you wear this special prayer scarf, you have special access to the Lord because it's, it's been anointed. Right? Or if you send me $25, I'll lift you up in prayer. And if you send $50, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll really intercede before you you know, before the throne of God. And, and there's this whole thing where they're just making so much money off of the gullible and the easily manipulated. These are the people that Jesus addresses in Matthew chapter 18, verse 16. He says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. See what Jesus says about those people? He says, look, if you lead my people astray, it will be better for you to row out into the sound and tie a giant rock around your head and jump in than to face the wrath, to face what I am going to do to you. Please, don't be fooled into believing in this hippie Jesus, right, this love and peace Jesus. And to be sure, that is a part of who Jesus is. Scripture is very clear that God is love. That's the, the overriding characteristic of the Lord, love. Jesus, to be sure, is the Prince of Peace. But Scripture also says that he's a warrior, that he is the lion of the tribe of Judah, that he's the protector of his people, of his bride. Those people are false believers. And the Lord will address that. And as I said, I think there are real Christians and good people who have been deceived themselves. And they're passing along some of that deception. And their motives might be different, but it's no less dangerous. In fact, I think it might even be a little more pernicious in that a lot of times these, these snake oil salesmen are easy to spot. But when people are sincere, it's a little... When we, we can tell the difference, right? 
And it's easier to believe people who are sincere, even when they're wrong. But we need to be cautious. What did Jesus say again? There will be false teachers, of, or Peter, sorry. There will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing destruction upon themselves. Peter says they deny the teachings of Jesus and the nature of Jesus. And we need to be aware of such people because they will be judged in the condemning way by the Lord. Oh, we made it through one verse. We're going to pick up the pace because we're going to go through the whole chapter this morning. And you may remember last time we were in it, I said, you know, we're going to, um, it was kind of a short section. We're going to make up for it this morning. So, uh, ladies, I hope you have a snack in your purse for your husband. Verse 2. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they'll exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Peter says many people are going to be deceived. Many people are going to be led astray. They will follow their sensuality. That word sensuality, aslegia in the Greek, this is the definition. Behavior completely lacking in moral restraint, usually with the implication of sexual licentiousness. Extreme immorality. So the implication here is sexual morality, right? Or immorality, as the case were. And I think we, we've certainly seen our fair share of this in the church, right? Leaders abusing. Leaders using their position to gain financial or, or sexual favor with, with the sheep, with the congregants. But that word sensual can also have a, a non-sexual aspect to it. Kind of doing what, what makes you feel good. Doing what is pleasurable. Paul talks about that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. He says, for a time is coming, and I would say it's probably here, when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Familiar because Paul is saying the same thing Peter is saying, and familiar because we see it all around us today. It says people won't put up with sound Bible teaching, with accurate Bible teaching. Their ears are, are itching, Paul says. So they gather up Bible teachers and pastors who hear the things that that they want to say. They, they, they gather up people who agree with the things that they believe already. You see that? And look around. How many churches and how many Christians have abandoned the clear, plain teaching of the Word of God? And as I said before, I am unashamedly, unabashedly a Bible-believing Christian. I believe that the Bible is true, that it's the inspired word of God, given to us, given to mankind. Right? It's not just some ancient text that, that fell down from heaven. It is absolutely a manual for us on how to live out our faith in an unbelieving world. Peter says, many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. Because of people like this, Peter says, the truth will be blasphemed. Now look, I'm going to use this example, but let me say I am not anti-Catholic per se. But I'm, this is a good example, so I will use the Catholic Church. There have been many 
absolutely horrible abuses perpetrated by leaders in the Catholic Church. And that's no secret, right? That this sexual abuse has been on the media for decades, and it's been going on for centuries. And how often in the workplace do you hear jokes and references about priests and little kids and stuff like that? It's kind of just become part of our culture that it's something people joke about. Because of these abuses, the name of Jesus and his bride, the church, have been dragged through the mud. And we Protestants, we have just as many issues, don't we? And they're different issues often, but we hear about all kinds of scandals in the church, don't we? Some pastor or Christian leader leaving his wife, leaving the church, leaving the faith to pr pursue his, his own passions destroying the reputation of the church, dragging the name of Christ through the mud. In verse 3, And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. We kind of addressed this already, exploiting the people of God for gain. Peter says, but their condemnation is not idle. Their destruction is not asleep. It's coming. They will be judged for their actions. And verses 4 through 10, Peter lists a number of examples of the Lord dealing, dealing out judgment, really, to those who actively oppose him. And as I said a few weeks ago, as we're, as we're going through 2 Peter, it's sort of, it's more of an overview. It's not super in-depth. And we could easily spend months looking at 2 Peter, not just four or five weeks. So we're going to quickly go through these examples. And each one of these examples could almost be a sermon in itself, but we're going to compress them. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness, to be kept until judgment. So here, he's referring to that time when the angels, led by Satan, rebelled against God and, and, and lost the war, right? And, and the Lord cast them out of heaven. Peter says God didn't hesitate to judge the angels when they rebelled. They're in hell now awaiting judgment. And I don't want to go too far into that today. That's a whole other topic. But hell was created for Satan and his followers. It wasn't created for us. As I said many times before, no one has to go to hell. It's strictly a volunteer basis. Right? People choose hell by rejecting Jesus Christ. He goes on in verse 5. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserve Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the ungodly. So if you turn to Genesis 6, it says in verse 5, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of God. So it says that the people in Noah's day were, were focused on evil. They were looking for new ways to be bad. You ever met somebody who's, who's trying to go pro in a sport? Right? They're consumed by it. They're obsessed by it, always looking to get better. That's sort of the implication here, right? Every intention of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually, right? They were trying to go pro at sinning, right? The whole world was like that, looking for ways to become better sinners. And it says the Lord, the Lord regretted making men. He said, I will blot them out. But look at verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of God. And that word favor in Hebrew is hin. 
which means grace, unmerited favor, undeserved, undeserved grace. And we're going to come back to that in a bit. But for now, note that God didn't hesitate to judge the ungodly world in Noah's day. And verse 6, If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormented, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their deeds, over their lawless deeds, that what he saw and heard. I need to make bigger font. I have to look close for him. I, I forgot my glasses. So you remember the situation here. Lot is living in a very immoral culture, a culture that was marked by pride and sensuality. And Peter says, look, the Lord destroyed them for that. You know, we, we talk about, you've heard the expression, fire and brimstone preachers, right? That's where this term comes from. Genesis 19, the Lord sent down fire and brimstone from heaven and wiped out the ungodly and Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities. So Peter says, look, the Lord didn't hesitate to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. And we're going to circle back around to Lot in a couple minutes. And I don't want you to get discouraged at all this judgment. The Lord is revealing it for a reason, as we're going to see in a few minutes. Verse 9, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. Again, Peter says, look, the Lord preserves his righteous people, and he rescues them. But he keeps the unrighteous bound until the day of judgment. And he says, especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and those who despise authority. Those are the people who stand down here on earth shaking their little fists up at heaven. I'll do what I want, when I want, with who I want. Bold and willful. They do not tremble, he says, as they blaspheme the glorious ones. And, and that term, glorious ones, most theologians aren't sure if that's a reference to the Trinity or to the angels or to both. And it doesn't really matter. But these false teachers willfully choose to mock and blaspheme the name of the Lord and his servants. But these, those false teachers, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming out matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Now I'm guessing from that, that Peter was dealing with some of these people already, right? Some of his people are getting led astray, and he's upset while he's writing this. He's a, little, he's a little impassioned. He's a little worked up. And he says, they count it pleasurable to revel in their sins in the daytime. Peter says, look, these people are living by instinctive sensuality being led by their sexual desires. 
And he says they don't even try to hide it anymore. They do it in the broad daylight. They don't even try to keep it a secret. He says they revel in it. And and when I hear that in my mind's eye, I picture a, a pig just rolling around in the mud. And he loves it. Right? Pigs love the mud because it's, it's their home. Look, genuine, born-again Christians end up in the mud sometimes too, don't they? We, we can fall in sin sometimes. We find ourselves dirty and muddy and defiled sometimes. But you know what the difference is? The pigs love it. They want to stay there. Sheep, the people of God, they might land there, but they're not happy there. They want to get out. They want to get clean. They want to be restored to the Lord. Do you see the difference there? They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts Trained in greed, accursed children. Peter says these false teachers and false believers have eyes full of adultery. They long for sin. They have an insatiable desire for sin. And they entice others to join them on their path. And it says their hearts are trained in greed. Not just greedy, They're trained in greed, it says. This word train in the Greek, it's an athletic word. And I looked it up, and I kind of chuckled when I looked it up. Because this word trained, literally it means to exercise naked. What's the deal there? But it's a reference to high-level athletes and the Olympics of the day. As you may know, historically back in Greece... The Olympics were were performed in the nude. And so that's the idea here, this word train, this this discipline of high-level athletes. Very often, if you're around, you know, guys who train in mixed martial arts or or jiu-jitsu guys, and they see another dude with with a cauliflower ear, say, hey, do you train? You know, when they're asking, do you do you work out in martial arts? And that's sort of the idea of the word here, right? They're, they're disciplined in their greed. They've, they've systemized their greed. And Paul says, or Peter says, they're accursed. Verse 15, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. So this is a reference to Numbers chapter 22. Remember, Balaam was a prophet. And you may remember the people of God, they're moving through the land of Moab on the way to the promised land. And there's a couple million of them at this point coming through. And and Balak, He's scared when he sees this massive group of people coming. He thinks they're invading his land. He thinks that they're going to they're gonna come in and dominate. So he wants a way to stop the people. So he calls this, this guy Balaam. And he's sort of mysterious. He's sort of a shadowy character in the Old Testament. We don't know a lot about him. It says he's a prophet. We don't know if he was a, if he was a, a Hebrew man or if he's a Gentile or whatever. But Balaam calls Balaam and says, hey, Will you curse these people for me? Curse the people of God for me? And Balaam says, well, I'd like to. But even if you were to give me a whole house full of money, hint, hint, I don't think I could. He says, I'd try to curse them, but but I'm afraid it just won't stick because they're the people of God. He says, but here's what you can do. I can't do anything. But if you send your young ladies down into the camp and entice the men of Israel, their progress is going to stop because the Lord's going to deal with them. 
And that's exactly what happened, remember? The young ladies went in, they enticed the men, the, begin, the men began to, to worship these false gods with these ladies, and, and all the nation's progress stopped until the Lord dealt with the sins of those people. And so that's what, that's what Peter's referencing here. He goes on in verse 17. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. Peter says they're waterless springs, mists driven by the storm. What he's saying in essence is this. There's no, there's no substance to false teaching. He says they're all smoke and mirrors. Right, we get fog here sometimes, right? And you can see the fog, but there's really nothing there, right? Nothing to it, no substance. Peter says, these guys, they speak loud, and they make a lot of noise, and they entice other people with their sensual passions of the flesh. And look what he says here. Here's the telling part. They promise freedom, but they themselves are enslaved. So many times, I hear people say something like, oh, you Christians. You have so many rules. You're in so much bondage. You're so enslaved. Why don't you throw off the shackles of that slavery and be free? Do whatever you want to do like I do. Don't worry about what the Bible says. Don't worry about those antiquated ideas of, of morality and sexuality and integrity. But Peter says they themselves are enslaved, in bondage to their sins. Paul says in Colossians 2.6, See to it that no one takes you captive. Note that word captive. By philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. He says those philosophies and practices of the world lead to bondage and captivity. The world can look at our rules in the church and see them as, as shackles, as ropes that bind. But in reality, they're safety lines. I remember when I was a young man, a few times, I was living in Southern California, and we went out to, to Joshua Tree to go rock climbing. And when you go rock climbing, you know, you put this harness on, and you're connected to this rope, and there's somebody else at the other end of the rope controlling your ascent and your descent. And, and that rope and that harness, they weren't to bind me, right? They were to protect me. Sure, they might have restricted my movement a little bit, but it was to stop me from plummeting into my death and splattering on the rocks. Right? It was a good thing. And I think that the world misses that in regards to the rules in the Bible. They're not there to restrict us and, and, and ruin our, our freedom. They're there to protect us and to keep us safe, to stop us from falling and splattering on the ground. For if, verse 20, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them to have never known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow, after washing herself, 
returns to wallow in the mire. This is a tough couple, tough couple of verses here, right? We were talking a while back about how there are some passages that seem to imply that you cannot lose your salvation. Once you genuinely come to know the Lord, you're eternally secure. You're saved forever. And then there's other verses that make us question that position a little bit. And, and I think these are some of those verses. Peter says, look, there are some people that escape the defilement of the world through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And then they went back to their old ways and were worse than before. And he says, for it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. That's that's harsh. He says, it's better for you to have never known the truth than to have known the truth and turned away. And then he gives an analogy. He says, dogs always return to their vomit. It's gross, but if you ever had a dog, it's true, right? Your dog, he goes and eats some grass. He's like, Four minutes later, he's over there, and you're, oh, he's eating it all up again. What's the matter with you? Or he uses the analogy of a pig. You can take your pig, and you can put her in the bathtub, and you can scrub her all up, and put a little bow on her, spray some perfume on it, but as soon as you let her go, what happens? Right back out in the mud. Because it's home. In light of those examples that Peter gives in other passages, I tend to think that the people he's talking about here were never really saved. They appear to be people who were involved in the church, who knew who Jesus was, who knew the way of righteousness. Maybe they'd even experienced some of the things of God but they never really surrendered their lives to the Lord. And I could be wrong, I don't know. But it appears to me that way. And regarding whether you can lose your salvation or not, I tend to believe that you can't. But I could be wrong. And I like the old adage, live like you can lose your salvation and have faith like you can't. Right? So we move through a ton of scripture this morning. That was a whole chapter. I deserve a little star because I never do that. <laughs> but, look, there was a lot of gloom and doom there, wasn't there? A lot of judgment and destruction. A lot of hellfire and brimstone. And here's the deal with that. Here's the deal with, actually, the, the whole of the Old Testament law for that matter. You ever go to a jewelry store and look at diamonds? Right? Maybe only one person's honest. Um, right? When they pull out that diamond for you to see, what do they usually do? They set it on a black cloth, right? That nice little black felt cloth. Why? To contrast the diamond, right? That diamond shines all the more brilliantly when it's contrasted against the blackness of the cloth. And the same way, when we understand the nature of sin, when we understand the consequences of sin, the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ shines all the brighter, doesn't it? I want to circle back real quick to Noah and Lot. God judged the wicked in Sodom and Gomorrah. And it says that he saved righteous Lot. Now, if you've ever read through that passage, it's hard to come away thinking that Lot was very righteous, isn't it? From what I see in Scripture, Lot was 
He was kind of a scoundrel, wasn't he? He was a drunkard. He was willing to, to sacrifice his daughters to the masses outside his door. Forget the fact that he, that he was in Sodom in the first place. He doesn't seem to be a righteous man. But the Lord sees something more than we see. And he chooses to show grace. Just like Noah. There's no initial indication that Noah was a righteous man. And he may have been. He may have been a good guy. He may have been the one guy in the world. I don't know. But he certainly wasn't sinless or perfect. But what does it say? It says that he found favor in God's eyes. That he found grace in God's eyes. The Lord chose to show him grace and to save him. And I think that those two examples should be such an encouragement to us. Because we all have sinned. We all have broken God's standard. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. But God, in His infinite grace and mercy, chooses to save us. And that is the gospel message for us. That's the good news. While we were yet sinners, Christ died to save us. We were infinitely undeserving. We were deserving of the same condemnation as the rest of the world. But in God's infinite mercy, He called us and He chose us and He saved us. And if you don't know Jesus this morning as your Savior, dangerous spot. God will judge all who oppose him. God will judge all who reject him. God will judge all who rebel against him. But he will save all those who lovingly surrender to him and ask for forgiveness. And here's the good news. You get to pick. You get to pick which team you're on. Will you submit to the Lord or will you rebel? Will you pay for your own sins or will Jesus pay for your sins? Because make no mistake, one way or another, your sins are going to be paid for. It's, did Jesus pay for them on the cross or will you pay for them with your eternal soul? But one way or another, they will be paid for. So I encourage you this morning to choose Jesus, to call on the name of the Lord and be saved, and experience the joy and the freedom that come from walking with the Lord. Heavenly Father, you're a good God. And we thank you for, for showing us the consequences of our sin so that we have the opportunity to, to change our ways, Lord. And Father, I lift up anybody here who, who doesn't know you, Lord, that you would work in their hearts this morning, that your kindness and your mercy would draw them to repentance, that they would turn from their sins, that they would call on your name and be saved. We ask that in your name.